ಸಚ್ಚಿದಾನಂದಯ ವಿಶ್ವೋತ್ಪತ್ತಿ ಹೇತವೆ ತಾಪತ್ರಯ ವಿನಾಶ ಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣಾಯ ವಯಂ ನುಮ ಜನ್ಮಾದ್ಯಸ್ಯತೋನ್ವಯಾತರತಶ್ಚಾತೆಷ್ವಿಸ್ವರ ಮುಷ್ಯಂತಿಯತ್ಸೂರಯೋವಾರಿ ಮೃದ ಯಥಾಮೋ ಮೃಷಾ ಧಾಂ ಸ್ವೇನ ಸದಾ ನಿರಸ್ತಕುಹಕ ಸತ್ಯಂ ಪರಂ ಧೀಮಹಿ ಧರ್ಮ ಪ್ರೋಜಿತ ಕೈಟವೋತ್ರ ಪರಮೋ ನಿರ್ಮತ್ಸರ ಸತಾಂ ವೇದ್ಯ ವಾಸ್ತವಮತ್ರ ವಸ್ತು ಶಿವದ ತಾಪತ್ರಯೋನ್ಮೂಲ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ಭಾಗವತೆ ಮಹಾಮುನಿ ಕಂ ವಾ ಪರೇರೀಶ್ವರ ಸದ್ಯೋ ಹೃದಯವರುದ್ಯ ಸದ್ಯೋ ಹೃದಯವರುದ್ಯತೇತ್ರ ಕೃತಿ ಶುಶ್ರೂಷುಭಿಸ್ತಕ್ಷಣ ಹರಿಯೋಮ್ ಇನ್ ಗ್ರೀಟಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ Niagara Falls. Once, the moon wanted to play with the ocean. And so on a full moon night, the moon entered the ocean and the moon and the ocean were playing. Now as the moon and ocean are playing, there's large groups of fish that are in that area and they're observing all of this and the fish are saying to each other look there's another fish that's uh, in the ocean this story is actually a saying for those who take for granted the moon is not just another fish the moon is the moon but when we take for granted by not reflecting we think this is just another fish This saying relates to Bhagavan Krishna. Bhagavan Krishna is not just a murti. Bhagavan Krishna is not just an icon to dance around. And Bhagavan Krishna has shared that he's become Srimad Bhagavatam. So Srimad Bhagavatam is not just another text. He's not just to be chanted. Shrimad Bhagavatam is filled with sweetness. Whenever you eat that which is sweet, you're never satisfied, yes? Halloween candy. Are you ever satisfied with Halloween candy? Someone had gifted us a tray of Ferrero Rocher. And I told Sheila many times, do not open that in our house. and she couldn't help herself and she said just one just one that tray is almost empty keep in mind chuka can't eat those vyasa doesn't know those exist <laughs> it is only sheila and by dusanga me <laughs> who eat those ferrero rochers there's no no end to tasting sweetness we are studying the details of shrimad bhagavatam so that we are captivated by bhagwan krishna by bhagwan krishna's teachings and whatever you are captivated by you merge with you become one with 
All we have to do is listen. When we listen to such a katha, we remember that we are Bhagavan Krishna. We remember we are happiness. All of the other purushartas, dharma, artha, kama, they come into our life, which means they will leave our life. Moksha will not come into our life. We are free. We have to re remember. And how do you remember? By listening. Srimad Bhagavatam has how many skandhas? Seven, right? Eighteen. Four. Let's just choose numbers that are associated with Sanatana Dharma. <coughs> there are twelve. And each skanda has a focus. Skanda one, Adhikari. Who is a student of Srimad Bhagavatam? How many of you have attended over 90% of these classes on Srimad Bhagavatam by a show of hands? Okay. Adhikaris, your access to Srimad Bhagavatam shows you are an Adhikari. The second skanda, the focus is sadhana. If one is a student, then one has to study, one has to practice. How many of you remember 90% of what, have, what has been taught in Srimad Bhagavatam? <laughs> I guess it was over. How many skandhas are there in Bhagavatam? One. <laughs> Sadhana. The third skanda was on Sarga. Sarga's creation. Specifically, creation of the elements. Then the elements go on creating combinations and so on. And skanda four, which we're nearly completing, is called visarga, which is special creation. What is the most special part of creation, the most special facet of creation? You. No one has ever told you that before, but Srimad Bhagavatam is saying you are the most special facet of creation. So the fourth skanda is about humans. And the fourth skanda is going to be completed with the most special purpose. Ordinary purposes are dharma, artha, kama. Pleasure, possession, position. But the special purpose the special achievement that a human can feel is moksha, yes, or peace. That is the focus of this fourth skanda. And this has been brought to our attention through, thus far, three personalities. Who's the first personality that we explored in this skanda? Daksha. Daksha is one who is engaged in action without yoga. When he was engaged in that ritual, who was not invited? Bhagavan Shiva. If we're engaged in karma without yoga, there is no purity of mind. That is not karma yoga. It is simply karma. So that whole narration was to Bring yoga into our action. The next personality we explored, Raja Dhruva. And I'm calling him a Raja, even though we were introduced to him when he was five years old. He was five years old and he was engaged in competition. Yes, his brother got to sit there, but he didn't. And then even with Kubera, Kubera had all of these followers, and there was a war that was going on. He was engaged in competition without Shreya. Competition without Shreya. What does Shreya mean? Long-term thinking or universal thinking. Competition is fine if it brings out the best in everyone. 
Competition is not fine if it brings out the best in me and the worst in you. I feel it's almost like capitalism. In capitalism, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Now, many of the rich people will share, we work hard for that. Okay, let's apply that to education. The good schools become better and the less good schools become worse. That's not fair, right? Shreya is where there's universal upliftment. And Dhruva realized that and tuned into that. Finally, we're exploring Raja Prithu. And Raja Prithu was engaged in expansion. He was expanding the organization of, of the world, urban development, engaged in 99 sacrifices. And then who was bothering him? Who always bothers everyone in our scriptures? Indra. <laughs> Indra was bothering him. And Raja Prithu was being bothered until finally he was appeased and said, what difference does it make? if you have that 100th sacrifice. It's like us. We love to teach the world principles, isn't it? And you know where, where we are all principles, where we teach the most principles? When we're driving. <laughs> when you're driving, how often do you talk to the people in the next cars? And rarely in a positive way, yes? Go! Can't you see it's green? Do you think they can hear you? <laughs> Even if they did, do you think they care about your opinion? <laughs> so Raja Prithu is one of those people. He's trying to teach the world principles. And Lord Brahma says, I'm the world teacher. People don't understand principles. Just let it go. So it's expansion with Riti. We should expand too. Riti means there should be a limit. There should be satisfaction. Okay? I feel that subtly, very much related to us, the first three personalities we've explored, their justification is being challenged. They are justifying their actions, their competition, their expansion. And they've not been challenged until Bhagavan comes and challenges them, no? You've heard me share this before. Gaurang uncle is sitting here and he said, you all have PhDs and I don't have a PhD. So I felt good, you know, wise person is telling me I have a PhD. I should call myself doctor, Dr. Vivek, <laughs> Dr. Gupta, right? I'm the more, the more real doc Dr. Gupta. <laughs> and then he goes, we all have PhDs in justification. <laughs> We're experts at justifying our perspective, our position, this is being challenged. And I hope this course is challenging you to know what your intention is with dharma, artha, kama. The last detail we studied was Raja Prithu telling his people the responsibilities of one who is responsible is to facilitate justice, to facilitate protection, to facilitate welfare, and to facil <coughs> facilitate order. That's what a responsible person does. We may not be the president yet. That may come to some of you <laughs> soon, that, that opportunity. <laughs> However, if we can operate based on these responsibilities. If we can initiate, meaning help others to operate like this, and if we can appreciate those who are, we are the beneficiaries of uh, this noble environment. What happens to Raja Prithu afterwards? We are on the 22nd Adhyaya, the 29th Shloka. Skanda 4, 22nd Adhyaya, 29th Shloka. Nimitte Sati Sarvatra 
ಜಲಾದಾವಿ ಪುರುಷ ಆತ್ಮನಶ್ಚ ಪರಸ್ಯಾಪಿ ವೇದಾಂ ಪಶ್ಯತಿ ನಂದ ನನ್ಯದ ವೇದಾಂ ಪಶ್ಯತಿ ನಾನ್ಯದ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಸನತ ಕುಮಾರ ಶೇರಿಂಗ್ ವಿತ್ ರಾಜ ಪ್ರಿತು ಡೀಪ್ ವೇದಾಂತ So how did the Sanat Kumar come? And I'll explain what this means specifically. After Raja Prithu had shared his address with uh, the Prajas, Sanat Kumaras were so happy to see such a lovely kingdom that they came there. It reminds me of when a great leader is going to speak then how many celebrities come how many supporters come right and the sanat kumaras share with raja prithu the way you've spoken right now is following four ways to speak okay and you've heard this according to bhagavad gita i'm sharing this according to shrimad bhagavatam please remember these four ways to speak it'll help all of our relationships we should speak that which is sara that which is sushtu that which is mitta and that which is madhu sara means that which is essential if it's not essential why say it? sushtu means relevant if what you're going to say is irrelevant then why say it mitta what you're going to share don't nag <laughs> be brief with what you're going to share and madhu to speak in a sweet way when uh, vyasa wants something he'll be impatient about it first you know he'll want scissors to play with with paper and then i'll say just so you you can't play with these scissors right now and then he'll kind of make his body smaller and look at me and say appa can i have the scissors madhu how can i say no to that <laughs> what he's saying it like that no see he already knows all of this <laughs> so we speak like this too sara sushtu mita madhu you will own people <laughs> whatever you want whatever you want people to do they will do it <laughs> then the sanat kumaras share profound vedanta with raja prithu and here are some of their insights for one who's tuned into vedanta the science of what is infinite there is no outside and there is no inside in our lives we feel this is the unreal world in, inside the ashram and then you have to go to the real world outside of the ashram correct it shows that we're not tuned in to full vedanta he shares for one who's tuned into this science of happiness there are no objects no objects means there's no way to be happy uh, dependently no object is going to make you happy so no object and he says there's no subject either in other words you don't need to try to be happy you are happiness the third insight he shares here the reason we feel there's an outside and an inside a object and a subject is because of a reflecting media everyone heard what i said reflecting medium and the two examples given are water and a mirror if i have a i do have i have a cup of water here because of this cup of water i forget that the source of light is that light bulb and i start focusing on the reflection correct and how strong is this reflection it's weak it's subject to a lot of change nothing happens to that light bulb right and a mirror too 
we often get lost in what's in the mirror. And uh, if the mirror is dirty, you look dirty. And Sanatha Kumara says, that mirror is the mind. If you can burn up the mind in reference to the water, if you can break the mind in reference to the mirror, all of a sudden the reflection goes away. No outside, no inside. No objects, no subject. There is only oneness. One who can purify their mind like this, they're awakened like awakened from a dream. This is incredible. I want you to think about the last time you felt really physically unwell. Flu, uh, a fractured limb, whatever it would be. Everyone's remembering that? Okay. And then you slept well. And you woke up. And uh, in reference to the previous day, it was like a nightmare, right? You're a brand, you feel like a brand new person. And that's just getting over physical ailments. All of the sadness, the anxiety, the stress that we've felt in our life is a dream. And when the mind is transcended, and the mind is made silent, we wake up, wake up to happiness. He completes these teachings by sharing those who do not tune into Vedanta. They are reduced to vegetation. They're reduced to vegetation. And that's dangerous. You know, everyone's a vegan now. So <laughs> you will be eaten, <laughs> eaten alive. <laughs> It's sad when you hear in, in a hospital that that person's in a, in a vegetative state now. Sometimes people say that, or I read that. That's described here. People who don't live in a more intentional way, they're like dandelions. They're like carrots. We have a bag of carrots on our stove. I'm like that. <laughs> it's what's being shared. Raja Prithu, hearing all of this, he shifts from being a grahastha into being a vanaprastha. And as a vanaprastha, in great detail what is shared, being one who's making this transition in their lives, comfort shouldn't come with you. We have the exact opposite practice, isn't it? As we make the transition from being involved in the society to being less involved, we carry comfort with us, but comfort is not to be carried with us. We are to make ourselves tougher. Swami Tejumayananda shared, when comfort is carried with someone, that comfort becomes their need. Becomes their need. It's like people with hot sauce, right? Those who eat a lot of hot sauce, can you eat food without hot sauce anymore? You can't, correct? That flavoring has become a need. Everyone from Andhra, that's you. I'm describing you right now. <laughs> and once this becomes a need, you start to be a beggar. You beg for that comfort. Coming back to my statement about all those from Andhra, you travel with your own pickle, isn't it? <laughs> Forget that which is made commercially. <laughs> you make your own. <laughs> so to keep that in mind, as you prepare for Vanaprastha, to be able to let go of comfort, you have to start doing it now. Raja Prithu even lets go of sadhana. <laughs> We're already there. We, we hold comfort, but let go of sadhana. <laughs> he lets go of sadhana because he's, it's so lovely. Even the English is lovely. He feels this spontaneous joy now. In other words, he's reached the sadhya. 
Once you've reached the destination, why do you have to use the path anymore? So this is all being affirmed and Raja Prithu experiences Mahasamadhi. Now one detail you have all forgotten in everything that I've shared, when Raja Prithu was born, who was born with him? Archish Devi, yes? I told you that. Archish Devi was born too. When Raja Prithu shifted to Vanaprastha and Mahasamadhi, Archish Devi did exactly the same. She lived in the same way. She supported him in the same way. He supported her in the same way. And they both attained Mahasamadhi. There is no discrimination against those who are married or not married in Srimad Bhagavatam. Study one more shloka briefly, and this is just an introduction into the elaboration next week. It's a fancy and funny story. Do you remember when we studied Ramayana and we studied Narada's Moha Prasanga? Remember when Narada wanted to marry that Mohini and then he ended up looking like Hari? Do you all remember that? This is like that, okay? There's a really lovely story. I'm on the 25th Adhyaya, the first shloka. Chapter 25, verse one. Itam puranjanam nari yachamanam adhiravat abhyanandatatam viram Hasanti vira mohita. The chanting is correct. The numbers are wrong. That was 32. I'm sorry. I mixed it up. It is chapter 25, verse 32. I was looking at something else. Okay. Correction made. Rishi Narada is describing a king. And what is this king's name? Puranjana. Puranjana is a courageous king. However, he's deeply attached and infatuated by this Nari. This Nari doesn't have a name. And so he's acting like a coward. Okay, so this is the lead up. In Raja Prithu's lineage, and there are endless shlokas about this, which I cannot elaborate on, there are two people, Javier Dhana and Javier Dhani. They marry each other. Their son's name is Bharhishat. Javier Dhana, Javier Dhani, Bharhishat. He was a prolific ritualist. You've all gone to a home of someone who's ritualistic. They have chandanam kumkum on all the windows, all of the drawers. It, your eyes burn because of that incense. Yes? <laughs> so he was a prolific ritualist. He engaged in so much puja that the whole world was covered in kusha grass. To engage in puja, sometimes you need kusha grass. So the whole world was covered in that. So people stopped calling him Bharhishat and started calling him Prachina Barhis. Because Kusha grass, you have to direct to the east. Prachina means east. I only share that because that's what he's commonly known as. Okay? He was a prolific ritualist. He had 10 kids and he named them all the same name. <laughs> Every one of them was named the same name. So they were a collective known as Prachetas. I like that idea. You can never be wrong with a kid's name, right? Like imagine I'm calling Vyasa and Shuka's name is Vyasa too. Hey Vyasa, then both come. <laughs> so these group of 10 were known as Prachetas and they were really solid seekers. In their seeking, they once came across Bhagavan Shiva and Bhagavan Shiva had this really lovely dialogue with them. It's actually called Rudra Gita. 
Rudra Gita is in this section. A lot of poetry, okay? If there was more teachings, I would have shared them with you. But one message Bhagavan Shiva shares with Pracheta says, Bhagavan's bhaktas, he's referring to Bhagavan Narayana, Bhagavan's bhaktas are as dear to me as Bhagavan and my bhaktas are as dear to me as to Bhagavan. Okay? And if you weren't following along, Bhagavan Shiva is saying, I love Bhagavan Vishnu's bhaktas and Bhagavan Vishnu loves my bhaktas. Even today, just recently, I heard an argument about the Vaishnava Sampradaya and the Shankara Sampradaya, and it's ridiculous that those Sampradayas feel like they're different when they're the same. Right here, Bhagavan Shiva says it. <clears throat> Rishi Narada approaches Prachina Barhas and tells him, why do you engage in these rituals? The purpose of living is to let go of sorrow and hold on to happiness. Do you think these rituals are going to achieve that? Ritualists do think it's going to achieve it, right? So Rishi Narada is uh, questioning him and he tells him, all of these animals that are dying in your pujas, all of those animals are waiting for you to die. And when you die, the way that you tortured and killed them, they're going to torture and kill you. Those details are all shared in Bhagavatam that they're looking over the clouds with their fangs and their horns and they're going to tear you apart. That's a good slogan for veganism, no? <laughs> Srimad Bhagavatam is sharing the truth. <laughs> so now, you know, this Prachina Barhis, He's not really tuned into what Rishi and is saying. So then the story comes. And here are the main characters in the story. Tomorrow I will tell you the story. Please note them down. Puranjana. Puranjana is the king that's being referred to in the shloka I just read to you. Puranjana has a friend. We'll call him Sakha. This friend no one can see. And this friend no one can see what he does. Saka. Third is, Puranjana and Saka are look, looking for a Pura. They're looking for a place to live. King, friend are looking for a place to live. When they find a Pura, in that same Pura comes a Devi. That's the Devi whom is referred to in this shloka. And there's lots of details about how attractive this Devi is. This Devi comes with 10 Sakhis. So she comes, but she comes with 10 friends. But she has one close friend who is a Ahi. What does Ahi mean? A snake, a snake with five hoods. This is her personal bodyguard. Ranjana. Saka, Pura, Devi, Saki, Ahi. Everyone got these characters. What is this? A story. Who is the story being told to? A ritualist. Who's listening to this story right now? You are. Because even as I'm saying it, you're thinking, oh, there's a story talking about someone else. Digest this. Tomorrow I will tell you your biography. You didn't know I can read your, your palms and your forehead. <laughs> That's why I insist on camera, so I can read your foreheads and tell you what your biography will be. Oh. 